Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I'm showing the V over here. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Um, a little bit ago, I was at a conference, we were speaking about type, type 1 diabetes, and there was a brilliant talk given by a, a woman, um, I believe she's a doctor, Dr. Becker, South African woman who's living in Dublin, Ireland, and working in the ketogenic space, uh, particularly with type 1 diabetes. Very interesting personal story. She'd been a type 1 diabetic from a young age, I believe it was three years of age, and eventually ended up on death's door requiring a pancreatic transplant, and the pancreas contains the cells that produce insulin. She was a type 1 diabetic, but a very brittle, busy dying kind of type 1 adolescent diabetic, and she eventually had a pancreas transplant, and now her pancreas is working well. She's protecting the pancreas on a ketogenic diet, on a mostly carnivore diet, I believe, um, and doesn't require insulin. But she gave a brilliant talk about her own story, and she introduced me to three to two very important concepts that I see in my practice, but I didn't really know they had a name. So I want to talk about these two things. The first one has nothing to do with diabetes, but it is a very a far more common issue. And I'm calling it an issue in my practice. Sometimes it's a benefit, but sometimes it's a liability. And we see this with patients. And I want you to examine yourself in this context. And the first word, the first phrase is called orthorexia. Orthorexia. O-R-T-H-O-R-E-X-I-A. Not anorexia, which is not eating, but orthorexia. And orthorexia is a term that describes an obsession with eating healthy food. It comes from the Greek word ortho, which means to correct, and orexis, which means appetite, correct appetite. But this is found, this is seen in a person who, with orthorexia, who is fixated, fixated with a quality that they believe is healthy quality, with a quality rather than the quantity of their food to an excessive, potentially harmful degree. And we see this in a number of people who are on what we call elimination diets. Clearly, veganism and obsession with eating organic plants and all that kind of thing, I don't agree with that necessarily as a healthy diet, but that is a form of orthorexia, where they won't eat anything that's processed. By the way, all the plants they're eating in any case are human designed plants, very little of it is natural, but veganism can be a form of orthorexia. But there are some people in the ketogenic space, especially in the carnivore space, oh, I won't do this, I'll only eat grass-fed beef. Ah, how can you eat food that was raised in a feedlot? It's a cow. Oh, I'll only eat grass-fed chickens and chickens that are free-range. I won't eat an egg as an egg. Yes, there's better and there's worse. I, I won't put pepper on my steak because it's a plant. I won't drink coffee. I won't. There's benefit to that to a certain degree. But in my practices as a, uh, someone that specializes in the world of addiction, carbohydrate addiction, the way I factor this is this. Take your current age. Take 100 and subtract your current age from 100. That's how long this way of eating needs to be sustained. Oh yeah, I've been doing this for six months. It's so good, I'm going to do it forever. <laughs> and then two years later, well, if, if you could sustain a ketogenic diet lifelong, we would not be in the ketogenic era. We wouldn't even be talking carnivore because Dr. Adkins would still be the way we did things. Everybody that did Adkins, oh my God, I lost 90 pounds, I did great. I'm going to do this forever. Well, we went through paleo, we went through all the variations, and we're now in a ketogenic carnivore space because at every level, people failed. They did really well, and then they crashed and burned because they didn't transform their way of life. They were not um, committed to this from an addiction transformation. That's the first thing. But the second thing is when your eating range is so narrow, so narrow, it becomes both psychologically as well as biologically unsustainable. 
BBBE, and I love Ken Berry, bacon, uh, eggs, butter, and um, beef is excellent to correct health issues. But it's unsustainable for the next 40 years, 50 years of your life. It's unsustainable psychologically and it's unsustainable biologically and you will suffer a deficit. Great to treat diabetes to lose weight. Absolutely. But even if you look at my friend Ira Cummings' recent video of those people that went to live with the Eskimos and came back to Belmont Hospital and were locked away for a year and only ate the flesh of animals. They did that for a year. Did great, proved that. And then as soon as they left the hospital, they stayed on a similar diet, but they broadened their diet. You know, just before we go ahead, one of the things that's always in my head is the protein sparing effect and how to promote adequate protein synthesis in the liver. Well, sometimes the human body uses protein to make sugar rather than to make uh, um, proteins. And... One of those is if you're at a glucose deficit or if you're fat adapted at a ketone deficit, because some of those proteins, about nine of them, actually when they get broken down by the liver, don't form sugar, they form ketones. So from time to time, if you've had a lean protein meal and you haven't eaten enough fat, popping something like this, ketone IQ, which is an exogenous ketone, will get you into ketosis very quickly, will restore your blood ketone levels, and then the protein that you've eaten will be used by your liver under the influence of insulin to make new protein, not to make sugar or to make uh, ketones. Look at the show notes down below for a promo code to get 20% off. Orthorexia is the fastidious evangelical commitment to such a narrow diet that it is unsustainable and potentially harmful. For a while, it's fine. For a while, it's fine. Right now, since the first of the year, I'm pure carnivore. And I'm going to ride the wave as long as I can. But I also recognize that a pepper on my steak is okay. Coffee on my, uh, to drink my coffee is fine. So if you, if you call me out for not being pure carnivore, because fine but I don't have orthorexia. And if I feel like eating some asparagus tomorrow night, I will. But question your, your nth degree commitment to anything and how sustainable is it for the rest of your life until you drop it 100. Google orthorexia and ask yourself, is that a problem? And if it is, it is as psychopathologic as not caring what you eat. Think about that, because it's highly, highly authoritarian. And that's what got you into this trouble in the first place. Hmm. Please leave comments. Fight with me about this. I've been doing this for 23 years, 24 years now. There's a lot of stuff that you are still to discover that's in my history books. And I'm not better than you. I'm not bragging about that. But time teaches you humility. And, and that is important. And I hope that you don't make the same mistakes as so many of my other patients have made. I love working toward a very healthy eating pattern, but have it broad enough that it's sustainable without causing you harm. The second word that Dr. Becker introduced me to, and this is primarily there for diabetics on insulin, but it's really cool and I want to talk about this. And the word that she used was diabulimia. We all know what bulimia is, which is purging and puking. But diabulimia, D-I-A-B-U-L-I-M-I-A. It is a Googleable word. It's a real word out there. I was unaware of this word. I know the concept. I know it very well, especially in teenagers. What is diabulimia? Diabulimia is where type 1 diabetics on insulin have a disordered eating habit. They're either angry at their disease, which is awful because it's a lifelong disease. They're either angry at their disease or they're upset that the use of insulin is causing them to gain weight. Because diabetics, type 1 diabetics, that are poorly managed with too little insulin should be very skinny because they can't turn the sugar into fat. But diabulimia is where a type 1 diabetic with disordered eating 
reduces or stops the use of insulin so that they can lose weight. Think about that. So insulin is necessary to get sugar from the bloodstream into the cells where it can be used for energy or stored as fat. And if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates and you're on the standard glycemic diet that the endocrinologists love, you're eating a ton of sugar and now you become more aggressive about your insulin. So the insulin gets the sugar into the cells across that insulin uh, uh, resistance that all type 1 diabetics have. It's the type 2 component. Shoves all the sugar into the fat cells and they gain weight. And when these, when these teenagers are pissed off that they're gaining weight as a type 1 diabetic or they're angry at their disease, they say, screw it, I'm not going to use insulin, or they radically underdose themselves with insulin. The problem with that, yeah, they lose weight. Why do they lose weight? Because they can't store the sugar and their cells are desperate for energy. Their cells are energy deprived. Number one, the the thing that keeps them alive is ketones and they go into diabetic ketoacidosis with elevated levels of ketones, but massively elevated levels of, um, of blood sugar which acidifies the blood, gives them mental fog, affects their thinking, affects their mood, affects everything about them, and the only protection is their youth. But diabolemia will kill you, or may kill you. And it certainly harms you. And it's a word I've never heard of. So if you're a type 1 diabetic, ask yourself, how do I manage this? And the first tip to manage it is not to eat carbohydrates. And the second one then is to reduce your insulin dosing appropriately to keep your blood sugars normal. Because if you reduce your carbohydrate consumption and you're eating primarily fat with some protein, you're not going to gain the weight. And then you need very little insulin. So please, 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 parents of children, type 1 diabetics yourselves, be aware of this and don't be a victim of it. It sucks that it's a lifelong disease. I know that. I, well, I don't know personally, but I, I've treated a few thousand type 1 diabetics now. And it's always amazing to me, and I'm, I'm always in awe of how incredible my type 1 population of diabetics are. Because how well they typically manage their disease. But please don't be a victim of diabolemia and do not be orthorexic. If you want help, if you're not sure if there's a problem, if you want a different way to manage this, give us a shout, 561-517-062. But when I heard Dr. Becker talk about this, it blew my mind and I thought I had to put this out on my channel. I know it's a little nerdy, I know it's a little esoteric, certainly that I believe it is, but the orthorexia is very common in our space. Far more common, especially early on with rookies. And there are some advocates in our space that advocate, that push their patients toward orthorexia. And that's problematic for me. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Whether you agree or disagree with me, leave comments. Throw me a buck or two at my Patreon or my uh, um, YouTube account, at least my um, PayPal account. And if you want to consult, if you want to know where you currently stand, give us a shout. 561-517-0642. Call Kim, set up a visit, text, WhatsApp. However you want to do it. That's our bat phone. If I've made you think, I've done my job.